Welcome to RICO 12. I'm Justin, your host and a grateful child of an all-powerful and all-loving God. RICO 12 is all about exploring the common threads of addictions of all kinds and sharing tools and hope from those on a similar path. We gather from diverse backgrounds, faiths, and places to learn and support one another. Our speakers represent various fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, reflecting the richness of our shared experiences. Come join with us in this journey of recovery and unity. Today's speaker for the 218th meeting is Andy T, who is a first-time RICO 12 speaker. I'm excited to, to hear his share on the topic of rebuilding from the rubble. We're going to be doing some spoken word poetry that he's written, and I'm just really excited to get into that. Um, we'll get to that here in just a few minutes after I uh, read a little bit of business. RICO 12 has several recovery resources in our family of podcasts and social media communities. To learn more, listen more, connect more, or just hang out and learn and grow with us, you can check out those other podcasts uh, called Noodle It Out with Nikki M, which releases every Tuesday, The Big Book Roundtable, which releases every Thursday, and RICO 12 Shares, which releases each time we get enough recorded shares to release it. To learn more about each of these podcasts, check out the chat or the show notes of the podcast or go to www.rico12.com, that's R-E-C-O-1-2.com, and to join in our communities and check out the chat and the show notes. I'll put those in here as we go along. RICO 12 is a self-supporting organization, and your contributions help us continue our mission. Thank you all who have donated recently and in the past. A special thanks this week goes out to Evan, Emma, and Cheryl for your kind and generous support as monthly spearheads. If you would also like to uh, support RICO 12 and become a spearhead, please visit www.rico12.com forward slash support and uh, for any one-time or monthly donation op options. Your support makes a difference in sharing our message of recovery. We look forward each meeting and each week to receiving from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today, Andy T. Andy T. had a spiritual awakening as a result of discovering meditation 34 years ago. It enabled him to put down alcohol and other drugs. However, he had a sex addiction that progressed up until he joined 12-step S fellowships 14 years ago. He now also does adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. Um, Andy T., take it away. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much, Justin. It's a real honor to be here. It's 5 a.m. here. I live just outside Melbourne in Australia. <clears throat> how I got addicted to pornography and how I'm healing from it. Two-dimensional, so easy, yet utterly unattainable, stirring a primal thirst which only a mirage could quench. So far outside the real world that I was gone, not home, and the only light on burned straight from the screen into my soul. Obsess, crave, resist, act, Obsess, crave, resist, act, regret. Again and again and again. My brain, a pink-eyed mouse on a dopamine treadmill, spinning off its axis and into the jaws of a snake as old as Adam and Eve. There had to be something in there. A payoff so powerful that all that drained time, all that isolation, all that shame was worth it. Oblivion, to lose myself, to shake free from all the things I believed were right and to just consume instead, to burn like a dying sun, hoping that in the end my star would collapse back past the big bang. Despite years of intense meditation, countless new starts and promises, despite trying Prozac, hypnotherapy and psychic guidance, my star was collapsing my gravity greater than my outward force. And on the other side, 12 stepping stones across the poison river, a river I have to keep crossing every day. One, hi, my name's Andy and I need help. Two, I cannot get better 
by myself. Three, whoever you are that holds this room of people together, please put me back together. Four, I dug with my pen, sifting through the fine sand of all memories, dusting off trauma's fragments piecing together new meaning with the glue of self-responsibility. Five, every relic, every sharp edge, every incomplete skeleton, exhumed and witnessed. Six, made ready for release. Seven, whoever you are that's inspiring the shadow archaeology, please take my axes my predator's teeth and bones. They've rattled around inside me long enough. Eight, whom have I hurt? Healing inside, how can I help healing outside? Brave conversations, number nine. Brave conversations, gentle text messages, incognito prayers. Responses ranging from venom to, I don't even remember, let it go. 10. A renovated house still needs maintenance. Mostly just self-checking and giving up the need to be right. 11. Whoever you, with a capital Y, are, I'm remembering you. 12. And I hope that this poem may give another collapsing star hope. Epilogue. Today, my devices are locked from adult content because in my head, porn's players were fantasy, not humanity, washing me down the river of disconnection and using women. No thanks. And who do I want to be for my beloved? Man or pink-eyed mouse? I will mention that not only was the pornography addiction making my life unmanageable, but I am also recovering from a mood disorder, um, sometimes called soft bipolar or bipolar type 2. And the more famous kind of bipolar, bipolar type 1, um, when someone has a high mood phase, they often need heavy medication or and or hospitalisation. Bipolar type 2 or soft bipolar <clears throat> those high mood phases are not as extreme. It often goes under uh, undiagnosed because when someone has bipolar type two, they'll they won't see a doctor because they're feeling so good, and it, it um, sometimes gets diagnosed next time they're depressed with um, standard depression. But normal antidepressants don't work um, if someone has soft bipolar. I'm bringing that up because um, it was a turning point in my life. Around about the same time I started 12-step recovery, I realised I had this problem. I was about 32 at the time. This next piece is called The Science Behind Our Love. And I first of all, I want to acknowledge my partner. We've been together about a year and four months, I think, and you might have seen her walk in and out of the room. Um, she's listening online. This poem is about a previous partner and what I want to acknowledge my partner because what I've noticed as my recovery has progressed, my relationships, I, I think I've had about seven relationships in, in recovery. And as my recovery has progressed, my, my re relationships have progressively got more healthy. So <clears throat> the science behind our love. Introduction. A few years ago, I was given an apparently chocolate-scented pencil for being a new performer at my local Poets Out Loud event. I told my partner I'd write a piece about us with it. I sharpened and I began. It didn't smell at all. Clearly, the universe is telling me not to believe the myths about love. Fact, November 29, 2015, A3 pages blue tacked to the ceiling above my bed. On them, marker penned prayers asking to be delivered from falling into the arms of another woman. It was less than a week 
after the 13th breakup with my final wound mate. Fact, our first date ended up back at my bedsit. This little trampoline champ pulled the pages down before she could read them. She jumped around also, trying to stop me, but I was too quick. Fact, there's nothing like a bouncing play fight to bond a couple of 45-year-old teenagers. Fiction, that's the only kind of fight we ever had. Hypothesis, the pencil was made from the wood of the cocoa tree and only writing with it allows fingertip oil to soak in and release fragrance. Conclusion, our love is the same. I'll change that. Our love was the same. A verb. I've chosen to call this set Rebuilding from the Wreckage, and there's a universal theme in mythology um, probably most commonly remembered in the story about the phoenix that rises from the ashes of its own incineration. And so throughout this uh, set, you'll see metaphors that relate to the disassembly and then the reassembly that I believe happens in the hands of high power. And I'm grateful today that all of that isolation and shame and suffering and all the all of the pain I caused myself and others, I'm grateful for today because that was simply part of the disassembling of my psyche so that um, high power um, can now be in the process of reassembling. Wholeness. 5,000 pieces. One, goal setting. Two, affirmations. Three, journaling. Four, pulling myself up by the bootstraps. Five, asking for help. They've lasted a few weeks. I guess they've still had an effect. Pieces of the jigsaw. I've done the maths. I'm one one thousandth of the way there. A jigsaw that I keep losing the pic final picture of. The picture's usually on the box. If I can just find it again. Is the box the routine, the worldview, the values I've decided to live by? No, nah, they're probably more pieces. The pictures on the big container of all the parts. I've tried just finding matching colours, finding what fits, corners, edges, and patience. And I'm exhausted. Big container. Shake me out and start again. This next piece is relating to love addiction. And when I joined recovery, I identified primarily as a sex addict. And then when I got, when I started to get a little bit of sobriety from that, I could see I had a love addiction um, as well. And this is a, about a woman that um, before I met my current partner, I became completely addicted to because she um, was emotionally unavailable. And the drug of choice for my love addict is an emotionally unavailable woman. And this particular woman um, was into ethical non-monogamy, which is basically having multiple partners and being honest with all the partners about it. And... I was so addicted to her that I could not think straight. I couldn't meditate. The butterflies in my stomach um, were so profound that I just couldn't meditate. This piece is called Rationalism for Butterflies. I have no control over the butterfly air show in my belly. Equal parts delicious and scary. Swirling, weightless, looping the loop in there. A flow to her of winged, flippity, floppity, irrational, bubblingless, telling me she's the one. When I know that for now, she might be open to a second date. This next piece is called In This New Day. I never knew kryptonite would taste so good. I tried swearing off it, it just got stronger. I tried flying away, it just got stronger. 
I know it could kill me. So who is this part of me that just wants more? If I keep writing, will I cut through my mild-mannered layers and meet him? Great spirit, can you help me out here? He's a totally tyrant. Give him love and boundaries. It won't be easy, but it is simple. Thank you. I've fallen apart to be remade one step at a time. Now a precious piece of your panoramic picture, a unique cog in the cosmic clock of creation as it starts to strike midnight. I'm tired, relieved, proud, forging a gritty integrity yesterday and in this new day. Feels great to be sharing like this at um, quarter past five in the morning, especially that line, you know, yesterday and in this new day. <clears throat> I guess for most of you, it's um, um, Friday afternoon. Um, yeah, it feels really special to be um, doing, um, sharing this uh, at the beginning of this new day. One of the things that I um, have found, I didn't even realize how profoundly profoundly lonely I was when I started to do 12-step recovery in earnest. I um, got the idea of um, 90 meetings in 90 days. Um, before that, I'd been doing a meeting a day for about a week of um, Sexaholics Anonymous. And then I moved to towns um, and there were no... S fellowships meeting in this small town where I moved to. So I started um, going to NA, the drug fellowship. And in my first meeting, I heard the concept for the first time of 90 meetings in 90 days. And a guy in that meeting, um, in one of those meetings, said to me, You seem like a fairly lonely person. And it, it, a bell rang in my soul because up till that point, up until he said that, I I thought that I was just a yogi meditator who didn't need anyone except God. Um, and um, for me, recovery from addiction has been about recovery from isolation. And I, I still am a member of a spiritual community I joined when I was 18, but um, a lot of my emotional intimacy comes from 12-step um, connection. And so recovery from isolation means hearing other stories. And what happened for me when I started to do a meeting a day was I felt compassion for the stories I, were hear I was hearing. And the stories were different to mine because I'd, I'd put down drugs and alcohol when I was 18. Um, I'm sure if I hadn't put them down, I would have become an alcoholic and drug addict. But the spiritual awakening I had enabled me to put down substances. Nevertheless, I was hearing the stories of, you know, former former prostitutes, former armed robber, armed robbers, former gutter junkies. And my compassion was so immense and it increased my compassion bank. And th that compassion bank, I was then able to show to myself. Uh, I was then able to show compassion to myself. So that's the power of meetings. The more meetings, the better. This piece is called When the Wars Are All Over. Today, I heard about a woman's aunt. Auntie Eleanor, aged eight, saw her big brother shot dead as, she hand, as, as he handed her onto the boat to escape from the war that was ricocheting around their heads. How does anyone live with that? Where does the pain go? It trickles down generations, turning children's and grandchildren's homes into deserts bereft of love and still all of us one way or another through one script or another trudge on carrying our wounded hearts our shaking hands our glazed eyes into tomorrow Carl Jung once said that every soul reaches for wholeness as instinctively as an acorn reaches for oakwood Carl Jung said that every soul reaches for wholeness as instinctively as an acorn 
reaches for Oakwood. Love. You are the sun to my acorn. You are the warmth that draws traumas poison out of my veins and distills it into compassion. Hearing those stories, I now know that my pain doesn't separate me from humanity. It joins me to it. My pain doesn't separate me from humanity. It joins me to it. And when the wars are all over, inside and out, we will come home to you. <clears throat> when I took on my spiritual lifestyle, I did it with a lot of intensity. And uh, years later, I heard the term spiritual bypasser um, and I realized years later that I was following this very intensive spiritual path um, addictively and um, I was trying to transcend uh, my emotional wounding and naturally uh, addictive patterns because of unresolved emotional wounding um, snuck out. Um, even though I had a persona of a, a yogi and I, my, my, I was wholeheartedly in love with God. And um, the big book of AA uh, talks about a particular type of person who professes so much love for God but still reeks of alcohol. Um, and that was me. And so the term spiritual bypasser is um, something that I am recovering from. And it's been 12-step recovery that's enabled me to get honest and put down the persona. I had a persona, a beautiful persona that I polished very carefully of uh, an urban yogi and spiritual teacher. Um, <clears throat> but I had a double life. Um, and 12-step recovery is enabling me to disassemble that double life a day at a time. That's what this next poem about is about. <clears throat> is me. It's called Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? There's no such thing as darkness, only lack of light. So I hid in the light, thinking that perfecting my persona was perfecting my soul, unaware that my beauty can never be free until she loves my beast. Cursed and lonely, he fought for my attention. But none are as blind as those who now see. In the end, he blew my house down so many times, I invited him in for tea. He told me Carl Jung once said, I'd rather be whole than good. So I took off my sheep's clothing, howled with my new friend in our grief. And together we followed a moonlit path through misty woods to the lake of self-forgiveness. Under, under this water, my light, my darkness, my beauty, my beast, dissolve into grace. And we're one. I never quite know uh, whether to explain metaphors. Um, I'm going to do so because we're all doing 12-step recovery. So there's a line, after I took off my sheep's clothing, you know, which was my sort of holier-than-thou persona, um, we followed a moonlit path, my wolf and I, and the moonlit path is 12-step recovery. And the misty woods on the way to the lake of self-forgiveness, the misty woods, uh, steps four and steps 10 because it's pretty confronting and it's a bit scary isn't it to shine a, a, a spotlight on my, the most um, ugly qualities and behaviors in my soul
Um, Justin, I just want to check. I, I've got a three-minute poll, um, and you're good. I'm aware it's 24 yeah. minutes past. Yep, yep you're good. Go ahead is, and say. This poem is, it's a it's a meditation on the divine feminine, and when I look at my sex and love addiction, uh, I recognize that there's a part of part of me that I just I just call the part of me that has mother hunger, and what I love about 12 step recovery is it's a God of my own understanding. It doesn't have to be of any particular denomination um, or religious system. It's a God of my own understanding. And because I um, have that mother hunger, then I really needed to find a divine feminine that I could um, receive nurturing from. So this is what this poem is about. Um, and I'd love to sit for e even 20 second silence afterwards just to just because this is my last poem of the set and, and just to contemplate higher power as each of you uh, listening and watching understand your higher power to be. As I understand her, foreign yet so familiar innocent, alien to matter. You never eat, drink, or sleep. Most importantly, you never forget yourself. Once in forever, you pour your unlimited consciousness into a human vessel. Contact. You're telling me that I too have a home beyond this planet, that my body is just a space suit, and that like you, I'm a tiny star. You're taking me back into your rose gold red lap of life. Weightless, oceanic, belonging. The apex of a vast self-aware constellation. The brightest star surrounded by an egg-shaped force field of love. An entity silently humming with wisdom and warmth. Magnetically drawn towards you, old impressions of time and space dissolve as I move through your aura. Two stars quietly touching. I merge into your acceptance, your unquestioning kindness, your tenderness, celestial mother and child. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Man, such good, um, powerful, powerful written, spoken words there. I really appreciate you sharing this, opening up your, you know, your innermost self to us. Um, a reminder to our live audience, if you have any questions for Andy, please type them in the Q&A link there at the bottom of your Zoom window. Two speech bubbles over the top of each other. We'll get to those questions as we go along here. But I've written a few questions here for you, Andy that I'd like to ask you and kind of dig a little bit into some of the, maybe the phrases from some of these, uh, these poems that you've got here, some of the ideas behind them and just get a little bit more uh, of, you know, background and, and depth in there. I don't know about depth, but a little bit more um, uh, open, you know, opening my mind to understand it a little bit better. So in the first couple, you, you referred to the pink eyed mouse, and, and I see that as like a lab, a lab rat, a lab mouse, whatever. But talk to us a little bit about how that relates to you in your own uh, addiction life, in your own recovery world. T talk to us a little bit more about the pink eyed mouse. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know much about neurotransmitters, but certainly in the last five or 10 years, uh, dopamine has uh, been talked a lot about in the fields of addiction. And so the line is, uh, my brain, a pink-eyed mouse on a dopamine treadmill. Um, 
and the reward center, which dopamine has something to do with, is just going, you know, over and over and over again. Um, and um, so it's a treadmill. And my experience with internet porn addiction was I could not get off it. And the f- the first time I ever went on the internet, when it, when the internet was a new thing. I was actually a visitor at a meditation center staying over for a night. And I said to the other brothers in the meditation center, oh, you guys have got the internet. I'd love to try it. And they said, sure. And they went to bed. And within 15 minutes of being on the internet, I was stuck on porn. And um, I couldn't get off, even though I was a guest in this meditation center and I felt so awful. And uh, I couldn't get off till 2 a.m. They, you know, the lifestyle of residents of the meditation center was to get up and meditate at 4 a.m. And I felt so seedy. Um, and of course, the other thing is, um, naturally, um, uh, sexual objectification is all about skin and skin, certainly for Caucasians is pink. So, um, pink eyed means I'm looking at pink bits, you know, and, um, uh, and I, you know, there's that saying it's, it's possibly from a, a, a generation that had different values, but this idea of what are you, a man or a mouse? And um, and so for me, a new definition of what it means to be a healthy man is to put down pornography, and then I can be a a man who has integrity, a man who doesn't use woman, women, a man who is a safe man um, for women. Uh, I hope that answers your question. No, I really appreciate you digging into that and going through that. Yes, that does answer my question. It helps open up my eyes a little bit more to even to what the. Uh, the pink eyed mouse is in my own life, you know, and I see that, I see that in my own addiction and my own recovery world. All right. We've got a comment and a question here um, from Patty from our live audience. Andy, your poetry is deep and beautiful. You are a rock star without breaking your anonymity. Is there a way to read more of your poetry? Thoughts on that there, Andy? Yeah, sure. So what uh, the set I've just shared, um, I've emailed to you, Justin. So I think the idea is, Justin, anyone who wants to see a written copy of what you've heard, please, um, yeah, email you, Justin, and you can send it out. Is that how it's going to work? Yeah. So so thank you. Thank you, Andy. Yes. So if you would like a copy, a, a document of these these poems that Andy has has read here and, and shared with us. I do have that document. Send an email to rico12pod at gmail.com. I'll put that in the chat here. It will also be in the show notes of the podcast. So anybody that hears this, send an email, ask for the copy of these poems, and I will send them right out to you. Thank you. All right. Next question that comes in from an anonymous attendee says, um, that was really beautiful. Thank you so much. Wow. I really felt that celestial mother and child. The big book talks of God being deep down inside of every man, woman, and child. This mother wound, this mother wound. Do you see a higher power as being the loving parent and us in our addiction? We are just wounded children. Do you see that relationship, or how do you see that, Andy? Yeah, um, I'm still thinking about the previous question, so I do want to um, let anyone know that if you would like to get in touch, I think probably the um, simplest way would be. Um, let Justin know, and Justin, I, I'm hereby giving you permission to forward my email address. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Uh, now, the current question, um, yes, I see that is exactly the case. You know, higher power is the loving parent, and um, when acting out on addiction, yeah, it's 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 a wounded child um, who, at that point, I know for myself, at that point when I'm acting out on addiction, I'm a bit like an orphan. Um, because uh, I do um, the 12 step fellowship adult children of alcoholics and other dysfunctional families. And the idea in that fellowship is um, my parents did the best they could with the tools they had. They may have been abusive, they may have been neglectful, they may have been all sorts of things. And now in 12 step recovery, I can get my needs met from my relationship with higher power. And that means I actually let my parents off the hook. Um, If my parents are still not available to be as supportive as ideal parents, then I can let them off the hook and go, you know what, I might even have to limit contact with them um, or have no contact if they're still whatever, narcissistic or abusive or whatever. Um, But I have a loving parent. And so, yeah, I completely agree with your comment in that previous question. 
Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that. And that perspective is is very helpful. Um, another question I, I pulled out of some of the things that you said, uh, one of the things you said, you know, my recovery from addiction was my recovery from isolation. Talk to us a little bit more about that. What does, how did you, uh, how do you now connect with others and stay out of that isolating uh, tendency that, you know, maybe someone of your, of your uh, personality type goes to, or maybe somebody who's in addiction just, just wants to isolate. How do you break out of that? <clears throat> yeah, I certainly believe addiction lives in isolation. And those of you who have been around in the rooms for a while would have heard that, the, you know, the saying that um, connection is the opposite of addiction. Um, and growing up in a dysfunctional family, Often a person, myself included, can get the idea that, okay, my caregivers aren't around uh, one way or another um, to support me. So I have to just do it all on my own. So often people come into recovery with that same belief system, which is unconscious, which is I have to do it all on my own. And so... um, my interpretation of step two, which I shared in the porn addiction poem, is I cannot get better by myself. So even if I'm an atheist, um, the higher power can be the collective energy of the group. Um, I heard a guy sharing the drug fellowship. His main message was, I'm an atheist and 12-step recovery still works because the collective of the group is a good enough higher power um, to get me well. So... um, I've come into recovery with this unconscious belief system of I have to do it all by myself and doing step work, doing written step work with a sponsor is a great way to start undoing that uh, unconscious belief system because I have to start trusting the sponsor, first of all. (laughs) Um, ACA talks about the, um, the motto of someone who's grown up in a dysfunctional family is don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. And so 12-step recovery is a process. It's a system that's set up to help people to talk, trust, and feel. And that undoes all that um, conditioning that happened in the dysfunctional family. Yeah, thank you, Andy. This is great. We got a uh, thank you for sharing that. We've got a, another question from our live audience from Josephine, and I actually had a, a question basically on this same line as I wrote it down. My pain does not separate me from humanity. It makes me part of it. Uh, Josephine says, I think I wrote this correct. This struck me so deeply. How beautiful that you reminded us all. Thank you. Do you see pain as beautiful for how it has the ability to connect us? What are your thoughts on that, Andy? Yeah, my partner says something um, that her sponsor um, says often to her. um, Pain is inevitable. Uh, Suffering is optional. Um, And do I see pain as beautiful? Look, you know, um, No, I don't like pain. I don't see pain as beautiful. I don't like it. And I still find myself trying to medicate it away with food or watching, you know, binge watching a series on online. Um, You know, I'm over a year and a half free of internet porn, um, but still, you know, the self-sabotage can come in with, you know, watching MA rated movies till, you know, the wee hours of the morning. Um, And I think that's some effort to medicate pain. But I know, you know, maybe I need to, I, I, I thank you for that. Maybe I just need to start telling myself this pain is beautiful and let me feel it because I still find it really hard, you know, when when I still have this mood cycle and when the mood cycle dips low, um, you know, it's just really hard to um, to stay away from those self-medicating behaviours. When I when I can stay away from the self-medicating behaviours, if I, I can, if I can not, watch the first movie like an alcoholic knows not to take the first drink then the depression doesn't get worse um 
and so yeah i'm still I, i'm still a beginner with that a beginner with feeling my feelings i find it really hard um yeah. but something about the compassion of, of being able to witness others pain without trying to fix it um i now um i now i'm a self-employed counselor and um in fact the story about um um called when the wars are all over um that that was actually in a counseling context that i heard about the woman's auntie elena who at age eight saw her brother shot dead <clears throat> i'm not sure if i've answered that question but yes yeah so so i'd like to follow up on that question maybe go a little for a little different angle because i i also just want to see how this changed because the line and the way i wrote it down was owning that pain is a joiner not a separator pain is a joiner not a separator how does owning that fact or recognizing that fact change things for you when pain is present or when you see pain in somebody else yeah yeah um i like the way you paraphrased that join is pain is a joiner not a separator um It's all about coming out of isolation. Um, I've been doing 12-step recovery in earnest for 15 years and bit by bit I'm recognising pick up pick up the phone before picking up, you know, the, the drink or the drug or the whatever it is for each of you that are listening. Um, the movie, the next text to some woman that's not emotionally available, whatever. Um, yeah, by coming out of isolation, I don't allow my pain to separate me. I, I, I'm able to, with healthy people who are emotionally available and supportive, I'm able, I'm able to talk to them about my pain. And in doing so, that emotion is able to be moved through. I heard a right, a great, um, line, um, it was talking about the polyvagal theory and um, being able to reset the nervous system. Um, and the, 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 the term was co-regulation. When, when someone is emotionally dysregulated, but they're with someone who is more emotionally regulated, and as they have an interchange, then what happens is a kind of osmosis where the dysregulated person sort of comes into resonance with the person that's more regulated. And so they use the term co-regulation. And I realized that's what an outreach call is. In in SLA, they call them outreach calls. It's just being able to pick up the phone and talk to another member. Um, so that's how, that's that's the journey to, to not let my pain separate me. I thank you for sharing that and some of the, the uh, uh, actions that you can take when that pain happens to maybe not alleviate it, but share it and connect, join with others in that pain. And that's good. Um, another question, Andy, that comes in, it's actually a statement and asking for your opinion on this or your thoughts on this. Uh, this is from Adriana, uh, who says this about, you know, you did mention a spiritual bypass, and I'm just going to read this. Thanks, Andy, for your honesty. What are your thoughts on this? Since there's not a specific question, here's the here's the, what this is. Sometimes I wonder if I'm taking the 12-step program as spiritual bypass when I am not consuming substances, but still I feel the hangover of emotions. I have to remember recovery is gradual for me right now. What are your thoughts on that, on that uh, insight that uh, Adriana said? Mm, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I'm not sure if I have a, an adequate answer my my sense is in general particularly if someone's in recovery from substance addiction you know the substance addiction can be so hectic um and so all in all consuming that in early recovery the person needs to do na or whatever the fellowship is with that same level of intensity just to get through early recovery so um if that means doing two meetings a day if that means dropping other friendships and only having friends in the fellowship then that's fine you know because it's not forever 
And over time, over time, that person moves through early recovery and begins to find a more stable, peaceful life and um, begins to find outside outside hobbies that aren't in the fellowship or or a new career and things like that. And and so it's a little bit like a greenhouse, you know, <clears throat> being being very enclosed um, in 12-step recovery and doing it with a lot of intensity. That's the greenhouse. And that's just simply so the sapling of recovery um, or the little, you know, tender plant of recovery seedling almost can can grow safely. But over time, I can replant myself out in the wider world. I can, I, um, and so that's that's one answer on one angle to that. Um, the other thing I do want to say is that um, they talk in SLA about anorexia, meaning compulsive avoidance of sexual, emotional, and social nurturing. Um, so it's not food anorexia, but it's it's a compulsive avoidance of. <clears throat> connection with others uh, on all levels and when someone has anorexia um a, a, a mentor of mine who who um sponsors people through sla anorexia um step work says it's important to do things very gently and at your own pace and so there's always <clears throat> there's always a balance there and lastly, um, I heard someone in the drug fellowship once say, in early in early recovery, I was doing I was doing recovery because I was so terrified of going back to what my life was. But there came a point where I realized I was doing recovery because my new life was so good that I didn't want to lose it. And so I think that may relate to the question. It's like a, it's it's almost like a turning point, isn't it? It's like Fear of the past drives me, and I have that gift of desperation. And then recovery promises come true, start to come true, and I've got this really lovely life, and and that becomes the motivator. It's it's almost like initially there's the stick, and then there's the carrot, you know. And um, I'll leave my answer there. I hope that's helped. Yeah, I I love the analogy that you made for early recovery in the greenhouse, being the fellowship of the greenhouse to really nourish and encourage growth and healthy, you know, developing roots so that I can be planted in the next place. You know, what a beautiful thing. And I I also love that last little bit there about uh, um, I didn't make a note of it and it's gone, but it was really good. And I'm sure it'll come back to me because it was powerful. Um, Instead of fear of the past, yeah, yeah, doing yes, recovery probably, my, not as a result of fear of the past, but as a result of gratitude for the present life. Yeah, absolutely. That fear of the past turns into my past becomes my greatest asset as I move forward. I it it now helps me become who I who I can be. I love that. Thank you for sharing that, Andy. All right, I do have another another question here for you. One more. We'll wrap it up here in just a second. You um, talked early about uh, a diagnosis of, I think he called it soft bipolar. Tell us how 12-step work and recovery work has affected that diagnosis and how you deal with that or how you interact with that diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think if I didn't have 12-step recovery, I would look at that diagnosis as a life sentence. But because I have 12-step recovery, I'm able to say hand on heart, just like I'm in recovery from addiction, I'm also in recovery from this mood disorder. And I can see that the highs are not as high as they used to be and the lows are not as low as they used to be. And that that I put down to primarily 12-step recovery. Um, I also, a little bit like the um, 12-step idea that I have to uh, look at the disease on a, on a, a range of levels, the physical, the emotional, the spiritual. Um, as a spiritual bypasser, I was trying to solve all my karmic bondages um, by only the spiritual, but the physical and the emotional. So I, I take supplements. Uh, I, I'm not on um, pharmaceutical medication. I tried that, and I wasn't. It wasn't right for me. Um, so what I noticed was that if I can just get to a meeting, if my mood is elevated and I get to a meeting, it grounds me. If my mood is depressed and I get to a meeting, it uplifts me. 
And so it's a great stabilizer. So the other thing is um, people close to me found me a pain in the neck to be around when my mood was elevated because I would be bossy, dominant, arrogant, evangelical, pushy, angry. And I was I was a pain to be around. And um, I've now been through step six and seven with different sets of questions uh, three times. And in identifying those character defects and doing my best to surrender them to higher power, I still get elevated moon phases, mood phases, um, but those character defects don't come out to the same extent. And that is purely a result of doing step work. Yeah, thank you for sharing that experience. I love I love your your honesty there and your openness and your your willingness to share that. That's really really powerful, I think. So Andy, you you said you wanted to lead us out in a guided meditation followed by that longer version of the serenity prayer. Before we get to that, I'll do the closing reading and then we'll get to that and we'll close this out with that uh, guided meditation and serenity prayer. Does that work for you? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. I'm not going to okay. switch out my microphone. I think this it's, it's going to be simpler to use these ones. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here. A big thanks to Andy for a fantastic Rico 12 weekly speaker meeting. If we missed your question or if you have more, consider joining our WhatsApp community. You can email me there to, to join the WhatsApp community. You can email me the same email to get the, the poems. To, to get in contact with Andy, the email address is rico12pod at gmail.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2-P-O-D at gmail.com to join in the communication to get these information. Um, if you haven't already done so, please consider rating and reviewing the podcast on Apple Podcasts. It's a very powerful way to, sh to work Step 12 and helping us get this message out to more people, more people who are struggling and who, who are suffering. Make sure to check out the Afro Euro recordings that Karen A. hosts on many Wednesdays where she brings in, it's a very similar setup to this, where she talks to people in the Afro-Euro time zone and does it at a time that's conducive to them. And next Friday, we're scheduled to hear from another first-time RICO 12 speaker, Beth E., who will speak to us on the topic of we must be rid of selfishness. I'm really looking forward to that. And stay tuned on the WhatsApp community and on our email list for more information there. And if you haven't already gotten on the email list, uh, send that, send an email to rico12pod at gmail.com. I'll add you to the email list and you can be notified of all of these meetings. Now let's launch off into the rest of our day with a guided meditation and a really cool version of the serenity prayer that Andy will say for us. Andy, go ahead and lead us off. Thanks, Justin. I'll, I'll just double check the amount of time I have. So my clock tells me I have eight minutes. Perfect. I begin by recognizing that there's a, a field generated by all the people listening and that field is unaffected by distance. It is supported by technology enabling the audio and video to connect us. But this field, imagining in this moment, inviting your own personal higher power to come into this shared space. Whatever your higher power may be. And just those of us participating in this meeting, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. But now we're adding our higher power and feeling the body soften in acceptance of a power greater than the self. I relax my feet. I relax my legs. I relax my arms and hands. I relax my middle and my upper body. I relax my shoulders. I relax my neck. I relax my head and my face. I don't have to fulfill any relationships with anyone else at the moment so I can unmask my face and just allow it to become completely soft.
relaxing inside my head, I imagine if if my brain was a fist, I imagine I'm gently unclenching. And as I unclench the fist of my brain, my whole nervous system, which is attached to my brain, my whole nervous system gets the message, oh, it's time for rest and replenishment. Sometimes called the parasympathetic side of the nervous system or the relaxation response. All the neurons in all my nerves are getting the message and spreading the message to every single cell. Rest and replenish, which is the opposite of fight or flight. Become aware of my breath. I imagine I'm breathing in peace along with my oxygen and I'm breathing out tension along with my carbon dioxide. Breathing in peace and breathing out tension. I let go of the past and I let go of the future. And I feel this moment expanding into a beautiful wide open space. There's a collective of this group on this Zoom and there's higher power in this wide open space of the present moment. Step one, I let go completely of any denial that I am an addict. Step two, I know that there's a power greater than me on feeling it in this collective and it can restore me to sanity. Step three, I offer up my will and my life to you, higher power. Addiction comprises of obsession, which is I can't stop thinking about something, and compulsion, which is I can't stop doing something. So in this moment as I offer my will to you, God, I'm offering up my thoughts. I'm offering up obsession to you. And as I offer up my life to you, I'm offering up my actions. I'm offering up my compulsions to you. And I am allowing you in this moment to take away my obsessions and my compulsions. In offering my will, my thoughts, I let go of stinking thinking. In offering my life, my actions to you, I ask you to help me when I don't even feel like it to get to a meeting, to make that call. I can't wait until my mood is better. I just have to do the action and then my mood will follow. Higher power, I feel your loving presence guiding me and nurturing me. I'm so grateful for this space. I imagine a light in my eye of spiritual understanding opening up into a vast expanse of red gold bliss. Supreme peace. I power you the ocean of peace. And I'm a light inside your unlimited light. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Grant me the patience with the changes 
Grant me patience with the changes that take time, appreciation of all that I have, tolerance of those with different struggles and the strength to get up and try again one day at a time. Thank you so much, Andy. Beautiful. Remember, everybody, there's one who has all power. That one is your higher power. May you find your higher power now. Keep coming back. Let's trudge this happy road of destiny together. Work it. You are worth it. I've seen stars fall from above. I've fallen in and out of love. I've been high and I've been low. Now I know I just can't do this on my own I've seen a boy become a man He got lost without a plan He's so far away from home Now I know And I just can't do this on my own your arms surrounding me Your touch is grounding me No longer searching for purpose alone Cause now I know That I just can't do this on my own For the words to say You make the world a better place And I can call that place my home Cause now I know That I just can't do this on my own Your arms surrounding me Your touch is ground Stars fall from above I fell in and out of love I got high and I fell low But now I know And I just can't do this on my own No, I just can't do this on my own I just can't do this on my own